Let us pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for this beautiful morning in which to gather and to worship your holy name. Lord, we pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon this place. Open our hearts and our minds to whatever it is that you have to say to us this morning. And help us, Lord, to allow your Spirit to transform our lives, that we might leave this place as your servants, ready to do your will wherever we are. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning... We continue our series on kingdom accounting, uh, essentially looking at the way that, according to Jesus, things add up within the kingdom. Now, I mentioned, I think, the first week that part of uh, our issue as the church thinking about the kingdom is often we have thought about the kingdom of God as something for the future, something that, that happens after Uh, we leave this earthly existence uh, and the glory that we hope we will share with God in the kingdom, in in heaven. And yet, we read things like in Luke, when Jesus says in Luke 17, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. So according to Jesus, and he makes other references to that, according to Jesus, the kingdom is not just something for the future, not something that we look forward to in the next life, but the kingdom is intended to be something that breaks into, that, that is part of, of this earthly existence. And yet, if we, if we think about it that way, and if we look at the world around us, sh- shouldn't the world be in somewhat better condition if, if the kingdom of God is actually breaking into this reality? Sh- shouldn't things be better than they used to be rather than the same or worse? So how is it, if, if the kingdom of God is not just something for the future, but something for now, how is it that things don't seem to have improved very much? And I'm afraid that if we think about it, we, the church, bear some responsibility for that. I think we have, have also bought into the concept that, that the kingdom of God is the church, that that we're already in, that it's, if, if we're showing up to church on Sundays, then, then we are citizens of the kingdom of God. But are we? Our Scripture for today, again, comes from Matthew's Gospel. And I think before we, we get to the actual Scripture, we need to, to know what has, has just occurred. You see, at this point in, in Jesus' ministry, He has made His way south. He has entered the city of Jerusalem, uh, and we, uh, on Palm Sunday, celebrate His entrance, the triumphal entry. That has just occurred. And having entered uh, Jerusalem, at least in, in Matthew's accounting, He marches into Jerusalem. He marches right up to the temple. He marches into the temple, and He begins to overturn the tables and drive the money changers out of the temple. And then it tells us, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. And said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself? He left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. 
So this is what has just occurred. He has caused quite a commotion in the temple. Then he began healing people, and the people responded. And the people recognized him as the Messiah that they had been waiting for. Now, what it tells us is that, that the scribes and the elders, the, the, the leadership of the church, saw the amazing things that he was doing and became angry. And so they confront him. And he pretty much puts it right back at them and then leaves. Which then brings us to our scripture for today. In chapter 21, starting at verse 23. When Jesus entered the temple, again, this is another day, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? So, one, he has marched into Jerusalem with a big parade. He caused a commotion and cast all these, these money changers out of the temple. And then he began healing people and doing what even the priests and the, and the elders admitted were amazing things. And so they come to him and they say, Okay, where did you get your degree? Well, who gave you the authority to do these things? Do you even, do you even have the education necessary to be a rabbi? Do you, have, you, have you been to what we would say seminary? Who gives you the authority to do the things that you're doing? Now, think about that for a minute. They see that he is doing amazing things. He is healing people. He's raising people from the dead. He's doing things that they would say one cannot do without the Spirit of God. And yet when he's doing them, they are angry. They're upset. Who, who gave you the authority to do these things? And so, Jesus responds, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John, that's John the Baptist, come from heaven or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say it comes from heaven, then he'll say to us, then why did you not believe him? But if we say it's of human origin, we're afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we do not know. Now think about the position that they have put themselves in. Now he throws John the Baptist out at them because John the Baptist was one that he knew that the people all regarded as a prophet. And so he says, well, where did his authority come from? He was out in the wilderness. He was baptizing people. He was telling people to repent. Not only that, he was telling Jews to repent. Now, see, that was an unbelievable concept because the Jews, similar to what I just described uh, regarding the church, the Jews believed that they were saved, that they were good because they were Jews. They were God's people. And so, naturally, as God's chosen people, they were all good with God. But John the Baptist came along, and he began telling other Jews, no, 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 no. You can't just rely on your ancestry. You, you can't just rely on the fact that Abraham was your father. You guys are messed up. You need to repent and be baptized. You need to be cleansed of your sins. That was, that was a foreign concept to the Jews, and yet the people, the regular everyday people, responded to John. I mean, if you go back and you read what John was actually preaching, it's the kind of stuff that you think, oh, well, that'll shut down a church. Nobody's going to come to hear that kind of stuff. He was preaching serious fire and brimstone, uh, turn or burn kind of messages, and yet 
people in in droves were coming out and they had to travel out into the wilderness uh, along the Jordan River to find John. And they were going. They were going out of their way to hear this guy preach and then they were being baptized in the Jordan River. I mean, this was nothing if not a movement of God. And so Jesus says, okay, smarty pants, what about John the Baptist? Was, was his ministry authorized by heaven, or was it just a movement of men? The problem is, even they recognize that if they say it was from, of heaven, from heaven, which seemed evident to everyone else, then why didn't they believe? Why didn't they follow him? And yet, if they say it was of man, well, the crowds are going to rebel because they all believed that he was a prophet. And so they back themselves into this corner where they finally have to say, um, we don't know. And so Jesus said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. You see, the answer to those two questions is exactly the same. The answer to by whose authority was John doing it and by whose authority are you, Jesus, doing it, the answer to those two questions are the same. If you can't answer the one, I'm not giving you the answer to the other. Do you guys remember the movie A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson? It's kind of a a military courtroom drama. And at one point, uh, Tom Cruise, who is the prosecutor, says, you know, I just want the truth. And Jack Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. That's essentially what Jesus is saying in somewhat less dramatic fashion here to the Pharisees. We want to know the truth. Where does your authority come from? And Jesus is saying, evidently, by your own behavior, you can't handle the truth. The truth is right there in front of you, and you're missing it. And so then, he proceeds to a parable. Now, unlike the ones that we have looked at previously in this series, Jesus here is not talking to his disciples. He's not talking to crowds of people who have come to listen to him. He's speaking here directly to these chief priests and elders. He's teaching, he's, he's speaking here to the religious establishment. And he says, what do you think? Listen to this story. Tell me what you think about it. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second and said the same. And the second son said, I'll go, sir. But he didn't go. Which of these two did the will of his father? And they responded, the first. Now, this is a, perhaps of of his various parables, this has got to be one of the most down-to-earth, the the most relatable to many of us, because all of us were children at one time. Many of us have had children. Either way, we have experienced this scenario, where we as parents or we as children have been approached by our parents who said, I need you to do this for me. Now, to be honest, most of us, if not all of us, have played both roles, the first child and the second child. Because sometimes we say, you know, I got lots going on right now. Um, My schedule is pretty full. I don't think I'm going to be able to get to that. But then at some point we think, you know, 
I suppose that that really is something that needs to be done and is important, and so we then work it into our schedule and we do whatever it is. Or, on the other hand, we say, oh, sure, sure, I'm all over that. And we do nothing. I have two children. Both of them have played both of these parts at various times growing up. I can relate to this story. It's reality. It's, it's the way children and parents relate frequently. But then he asks, well, which one did the will of his father? Is it the one who, who was honest? Now, sometimes that honesty grates on us as parents. What do you mean, no? Get your rear end out there and do what I tell you to do. But at least they're saying what they think. You know, I, I, got, oh, I got stuff to do. I, I got so much stuff to do, I, I can't do that today. But then, whether it's through guilt or maybe even actual love and devotion, they somehow managed to go and do what they were asked to do. Or the one who says what you want to hear, who says all the right things, who says, oh, I would love to do that for you, but then they don't actually do anything. So Jesus tells this story to to the religious establishment and says, what do you think? How does this relate to this conversation we've been having? But then he, he sums it up for them himself. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Well, now this was sure to get their attention, at at least briefly. I mean, once they actually realized what he had said, they probably became so infuriated that they missed the point. You see, from, from a Pharisee's point of view, I mean, if you, if you read through the Gospels, time after time, it will refer to sinners and tax collectors. That's because from a Jewish perspective, Tax collectors were their own category of sinners. They were, they were Jews who had turned on their own people and were working for the Roman government to collect taxes. And not just collect taxes, but collect more than they were supposed to collect so they could kind of skim off the top. So they were getting rich off of their own people. So for the Jews, tax collectors were even worse than your sort of regular old run-of-the-mill sinners. And prostitutes, I mean, the, the legend is that's the oldest profession in the world. But generally speaking, it is one that most people would agree, you know, if, if sin is a reality, that, that probably qualifies. So we have these two categories of what we might call super sinners. And Jesus says to this religious establishment, these guys are going to get into the kingdom before you are. That's an eye-opener. Well, what do you mean? I mean, the Pharisees were not... we, We actually have writings of Pharisees where they wrote down prayers. And there is actual records of Pharisees praying, thank you, God, 
then I am not like other people, like, like tax collectors or prostitutes. So, I mean, these were the, the top of the category for Pharisees. And, and to say these people are getting into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you would have been a gut punch to the Pharisees. But think about the story. You see, the Pharisees represented the religious establishment. And the Pharisees were the ones who said all the right things. They're the ones who made it appear that they were righteous. And yet, what they actually did revealed their heart. Whereas the sinners, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and many others, they saw Jesus. They saw John the Baptist first and then they saw Jesus and they responded. And they repented. And their lives were transformed by the Holy Spirit. They were changed. It was, it was evident. People could tell by their behavior that they were no longer the same people that they had been before. And yet, these in the religious establishment, even when they saw and they recognized there are amazing things happening. Jesus is doing amazing things things, but they didn't allow it to change them. They didn't allow it to affect how they then behaved. They saw it as a threat to, to their power, to their security, and they turned against Jesus rather than following. You see, the kingdom of heaven isn't just the church. It isn't just about showing up on Sunday mornings. The kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is king. It is wherever Jesus rules. It is wherever His followers actually follow. It's where His followers actually do the things that He told us to do. He said, make disciples of all nations, teaching them to do all that I have told you. He said, we can, we can say that we believe. We can say that we trust Jesus. We can say that we're Christians. We can say that we are citizens of the kingdom. But if we aren't being transformed, if, if there is no evidence... then what are we? Years ago when I was the youth director here, I for a while had a sign in my office that said, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's really the question. We can say a lot of things. But is there any evidence that what we say is truly who we are? We are called into the kingdom of God. But if we don't allow ourselves to be transformed by God's Holy Spirit, if we are not changed, if, if the way that we behave, the way that we act, the things that we do in the world are not any different than they were before, then how is the world going to change? If we can't live out this gospel, nobody else is. If we can't live differently, then how is anyone else going to see that there's an option, that, that there's another way? We have to change. 
we have to live differently. And if we can do that, if we can allow God to transform us, to change us, to change our behavior, then maybe slowly we'll begin to see change in the world around us. In the field of counseling, we have a sort of weird little saying that if nothing changes, nothing changes. People often enter counseling wanting their lives to be better, wanting their lives to be richer or easier, but not wanting to do anything differently. We have to change in order to affect change. And the only real way to change our hearts is to allow the Holy Spirit in, to be transformed. And then, in order to do what He taught us to do, we actually have to know what it is He taught us to do. We have to study His Word, that we might be changed, that our world might be changed, that the kingdom of heaven might be a reality here on earth, that God's will might be done on earth as it is in heaven, to His honor and glory. And in Jesus' name, amen.